Hello and welcome back. My name is Gavin. This is my channel. Thank you very much for joining me today, December 24th, 2021. I was not going to do a video today, but something happened in two cases uh, that I want to bring you up to date on. The first case that I just want to give you a quick update on is the case of Ellen Greenberg. I got a text from her mother a little bit earlier today. This is the text and it says, late yesterday, the city, meaning Philadelphia, filed papers asking again for permission to take, or I think she means make an appeal. It did so earlier, but the trial court denied the request and cleared the way for this case to go to trial. The city's new filing will likely further delay the trial of this case and the truth about Ellen being made public. We cannot understand why, particularly during the holiday season, the city is fighting to suppress the truth and the justice to which Ellen is entitled. Um, so just so you guys know, we thought that maybe this case would go to trial in January and now looks like that's going to be delayed. Um, I I believe that the judge is probably going to deny that request, but that will still delay things because that means that they have another couple of hoops to go through before they can schedule that, that trial. Um, Mrs. Greenberg brings up a valid point, you know, wondering why, why is the city fighting against this so bad? And, um, my only experience is in uh, a few other cases where uh, a city or a county or a municipality is fighting against uh, something that is just so obviously wrong. <clears throat> I don't know what the incentives are that make them behave that way, but they do. And uh, unfortunately, it's not unique to Ellen Greenberg's case. Um, that I mean, that would be bad enough, but it is... It happens all the time. I, I don't know why they do it. Um, and that I actually said that to Mrs. Greenberg. I, I don't know why, uh, you know, public servants cover up corruption. Um, I don't understand the incentive behind doing that, but they still do it. I think that they are gritty enough that they will just stay the course and, um, and they will win this. The Second piece of news has to do with the case of Father Joe Marino. Now, this is a little bit of a story I, I want to tell you. Um, I am not an early riser, guys. I am I am a late, I'm a night owl, right? I And when I wake up in the morning, I, I wake up kind of slowly. Uh, this being Christmas Eve, I was sleeping in. Uh, Kimberly is awesome. She gets up early every day and... Uh, you know, does several things that she likes to do. Today's a busy day. Um, but the doorbell rang, which sets our dog off. She barks and barks and barks. And, uh, that kind of got me going. And, uh, after the dog stopped barking and I was kind of awake, Kimberly came up to the bedroom with a piece of paper in her hand. Full, it was this piece of paper. It was folded like this. And she kind of had a twinkle in her eye, a little like look of pride on her face. And she says, you got a cease and desist letter. So it was delivered to our house by our county constable. That has never happened to us before. And we got this letter right here uh, from the law office of uh, Cassioni. I don't know. All these people in White Plains or East Chester, New York. And uh, it was sent to, to me. Um, I don't know why it says via priority mail because it was delivered by the constable. Anyway, this attorney on behalf of his client is saying that I have stolen some intellectual property of his client and he's sending me this cease and desist letter. Let's read the letter. It says, Dear Mr. Fish, I am counsel to Forensic Environmental and Emergency Management Associates, Inc., and its principals, principals, Michael E. Archer and Drew B. Caprud. They inform me that you produce a podcast on various topics for public consumption. Well, they inform him incorrectly because I do not produce a podcast. I produce YouTube videos. But um, I write to demand that you forthwith that's a hard word for me, cease and desist in the theft of my client's intellectual property to wit your appropriation and unconsented 
I think that's a typo, use of their investigatory work in the Father Joseph Marino case. So, I mean, like, I, I don't even know what to say at this point, right? I guess maybe it's best to just read the second paragraph and then we can talk about it. If you continue to appropriate their content, my clients have directed that I file an action in the United States District Court in the Southern District of New York, seeking actual and punitive damages as well as costs and fees. Either acknowledge in writing that you will no longer continue this course of conduct or put your insurance carrier on notice and have your attorney contact me without delay. Okay, number one, that sentence, put your insurance carrier on notice, kind of, kind of made me wonder what kind of attorneys these are. And I looked up this law office, Cascione, Percy Glotti, and Galuzzi PC in East Chester, New York. They are personal injury attorneys. So I think maybe this might be a, uh, a form letter that they use because I don't know what insurance would cover this. <laughs> anyway, I'm asking myself, you know, what, what content have I used that belongs to uh, Mr. Archer and Mr. Caprude? Now, I have spoken to Michael Archer before. Um, I was introduced to him by Leslie Brill Meserol, who is the mother of Amanda Winkowski. Um, but before I get into that, I, I probably should just say how I got to know about the father Joe case in the first place. Basically what happened is I got, um, an anonymous tip on my website saying you really should look into the case of father, father Joe. And it gave me a link. And this is the link that it gave me. It lands on a page called churchmilitant.com. And the article is titled Spotlight, Death of a Whistleblower Pol uh, Priest. And there is a pretty long article about, well, I guess it's not a long article. Oh, there are just lots. There's a short article about uh, Father Joe. And there is a 43-minute uh, video. So this was back in March of 20, um, 2020, I think. No, March of 2021. So March of this year, I saw their video. Now in their video, this guy, Michael Archer, uh, who says that he is a forensic scientist, um, did uh, a reenactment like in a hotel room of what Father Joe would have had to have done in order to kill himself with his right hand. If you don't really know what I'm talking about, I'll put links in the description below. You can, you can look at the videos that I've done on father Joe. Okay. So I watched that video and then, um, I don't know how much longer later it wasn't immediate. It could have been days or weeks. It could have been a month. I don't know. But I, um, I was talking with Leslie and I said, Hey, I, um, I saw this case in Buffalo, New York, about a priest who uh, the same medical examiner that said that Amanda killed herself by overdosing said that he committed suicide. And I watched this video and um, I just think it's interesting that Dr. Verdes would say that this guy committed suicide when it appears that he couldn't have done that. And she and she actually told me in that conversation. I know all about this case because father Joe was Amanda's priest and I know his sister Sue. I know all about this case. And so Leslie introduced me to Sue Marino, father Joe's twin sister. And then over the course of many months, because I didn't, I didn't publish a video about father Joe until this month. Um, so March or let, let's say that was a month later. So April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So not, about nine months, maybe eight months between the time that I found out about father Joe's case and the first time that I made a video. Now, what was I doing during all that time? Well, Leslie introduced me to Sue 
and I spoke with Sue. I visited her personally up in Buffalo, New York, and I looked through the documents that she had and the ones that she had scanned, she provided them to me. Uh, I then began to study the case and I began to do my investigation uh, into the case based on all of the documents, the photos, everything that she had provided to me. I then, uh, I even went, I went back up there and I scanned even more uh, documents from, from Sue that just happened a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and I've been going through those. And so if you go back to my channel, you'll see that there's an introduction video and there is a video about, uh, the provenance of the gun, uh, that was ostensibly used to kill father Joe. Okay. Um, now somewhere in there in those eight or nine months, I was, I received a text from Leslie saying, Hey, give me a call, please. And she does that because, um, my phone does not accept blocked calls and her, her number is blocked. So she always texts me and asks me to give her a call. When I called, um, Michael Archer was on the phone. I was tapped into a three-way call. Uh, she introduced me to Michael. I think she had been introduced to Michael. I'm not sure of this, but I think she had been introduced to Michael Archer by Sue Marino. And uh, Michael wanted access to Amanda's records. Now, um, I explained on that phone call that I am not the owner of Amanda's records. I have them in my possession. And if Leslie instructs me to share those records with you, I will gladly do so. If she tells me, no, you can't have them, then I won't give them to you. Uh, Leslie gave, gave me permission to share those documents with, with Michael Archer. And that was the first, last, only time I ever spoke to the man. Um, I've never spoken about him. And this letter, which came in the mail today, or no, it didn't come in the mail. It came by uh, the county constable was, I mean, the, I, I've not thought about this guy, uh, since that phone call. And he is, um, he is saying that I have used his intellectual property. I find it interesting that he has not told me what that intellectual property is that I have allegedly used. But what I can say without a doubt is that I have not used his intellectual property. You can go and watch the videos. They're in the public domain. I have not used the church militant video. I have not used any, oh, and then what I did this morning as I was on my way to the gym, I called Sue and I was like, hey, Sue, I got this letter. Um, Michael Archer is alleging that I have stolen his intellectual property. Any of the documents that you've shared with me, are those his work product? And she said unequivocally, no, anything, any document that I have shared with you, I have gotten by doing freedom of information law requests. And I have all the requests. I have all the canceled checks. There is no document that Michael Archer has unearthed or has provided that I have given to you. It is everything that you have is my work product. So I don't know what uh, Michael Archer is all about on this. I'm definitely going to have my attorney uh, answer the letter. Um, and, uh, and, and basically I'm just going to ask what intellectual property do you believe that you own that, uh, that I used <laughs> because this is just, this letter has, um, uh, has no good information. It's it, it is just a threat. I, I, I personally, I don't know why he would do this. I, I don't know if he's threatened by my coverage of the story, um, the, the story of father Joe is not a, it's not a story that I own. It's not a story that, that he owns. It is a story that happened to father Joe and his family in the city of Buffalo, New York. Um, so I guess we'll see what he says now, guys, I have to tell you, one of the things that really bothers me about this kind of thing, receiving a letter like this from, uh, the 
personal injury attorneys of Michael Archer and Drew Caprude. I don't even know who that that is. I've never heard that name prior to reading it in this letter today. Um, what really bothers me about this is that this is going to cost me time and money to defend myself from completely spurious allegations from a person who believes without foundation, as far as I can tell, that I have I have u- utilized his um, his work product and therefore have stolen his intellectual property that now is going to cost me time and money and that time and that money could be used to work on actually father Joe's case or Amanda's case or Ellen Greenberg's case or Rochelle Brinson's case or Shelby Thornburg's case, all the cases that I'm looking into right now, I have to engage an attorney and I have to, I have to, I have to deal with this and this kind of stuff bothers me. And so, um, I guess, I guess what I'm saying here is thank you for supporting me by watching this video and thank you. Thank you. Thank you to my patrons who support me over on Patreon. Those $3 a month, man, they, they really help. Um, I think that this month's <laughs> Patreon, uh, I guess, check, whatever you want to call it is going to go in part to, uh, my attorney who is going to have to, to write a letter back to, Mr. What's his name here? Mr. Or Ms. Uh, Mr. Thomas G. Cassioni. So, uh, yeah, so that's my update for you guys on those two cases. Uh, I don't think that I'm going to do another. Well, yeah, I'll probably do one video this coming Tuesday. It will be on the Ellen Greenberg case. Uh, it's going to be part of the interview that I did with, um, with their investigator. Um, a man named Tom Brennan, who is an impressive, has a long, uh, credentialed past of investigating homicides. I had a long conversation with him. I'll be sharing that with you. And then that will likely be my last video of the year. And then starting in the new year, starting January 1st, we are going to do a video every single day. Uh, to commemorate the solving of the the 340 cipher of the Zodiac Killer, we're going to do a video a day talking about the unsolved murders of uh, Zodiac victims and victims who uh, we believe or people believe are somehow connected to the Zodiac Killer. So with that, I will bid you adieu and I hope to see you on Tuesday. Take care. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.